Chapter 2 The glad days that dawn gave me liberty for the free play of impulse and from anxiety and restraint. A leap to license and thoughtless action. My mother arrived one afternoon with the news that we were going to live with her sister in Elaine, Arkansas, and that en route we would visit Granny, who had moved from Natchez to Jackson, Mississippi. As the words fell from my mother's lips, a long and heavy anxiety lifted from me. Excited, I rushed about and gathered my ragged clothes. I was leaving the hated home, hunger, fear, leaving days that had been as dark and lonely as death. While I was packing, a playmate came to tell me that one of my shirts was hanging damp upon the clothesline. Filled more with the sense of coming freedom than with generosity, I told him that he could have it. What was a shirt to me now? The children stood about and watched me with envious eyes as I crammed my things into a suitcase, but I did not notice them. The moment I had learned that I was to leave, my feelings had recoiled so sharply and quickly from the home that the children simply did not exist for me any more. Their faces possessed the power of evoking in me a million memories that I longed to forget, and instead of my leaving, drawing me to them in communion, it had flung me forever beyond them. I was so eager to be gone that when I stood in the front hallway, packed and ready, I did not even think of saying goodbye to the boys and girls with whom I had eaten and slept and lived for so many weeks. My mother scolded me for my thoughtlessness and bade me say goodbye to them. Reluctantly I obeyed her, wishing that I did not have to do so. As I shook the dingy palms extended to me, I kept my eyes averted, not wanting to look again into the faces that hurt me because they had become so thoroughly associated in my feelings with hunger and fear. In shaking hands, I was doing something that I was to do countless times in the years to come. Acting in conformity with what others expected of me, even though, by the very nature and form of my life, I did not and could not share their spirit. After I had outlived the shocks of childhood, after the habit of reflection had been born in me, I used to mull over the strange absence of real kindness in Negroes. How unstable was our tenderness! How lacking in genuine passion we were! How void of great hope! How timid our joy! How bare our traditions! How hollow our memories! How lacking we were in those intangible sentiments that bind man to man, and how shallow was even our despair. After I had learned other ways of life, I used to brood upon the unconscious irony of those who felt that Negroes led so passional an existence. I saw that what had been taken for our emotional strength was our negative confusions, our flights, our fears, our frenzy under pressure. Whenever I thought of the essential bleakness of black life in America, I knew that Negroes had never been allowed to catch the full spirit of Western civilization, that they lived somehow in it but not of it. And when I brooded upon the cultural barrenness of black life, I wondered if clean, positive tenderness love, honor, loyalty, and the capacity to remember were native with men. I asked myself if these human qualities were not fostered, won, struggled and suffered for, preserved in ritual from one generation to another. Granny's home in Jackson was an enchanting place to explore. It was a two-story frame structure of seven rooms. My brother and I used to play hide-and-seek in the long, narrow hallways and on and under the stairs. Granny's son, Uncle Clark, 
had bought her this home and its white plastered walls, its front and back porches, its round columns and banisters made me feel that surely there was no finer house in all the round world. There were wide green fields in which my brother and I roamed and played and shouted. And there were the timid children of the neighbors, boys and girls to whom my brother and I felt superior in worldly knowledge. We took pride in telling him what it was like to ride on a train, what the yellow, sleepy Mississippi River looked like, how it felt to sail on the Kate Adams, what Memphis looked like, and how I had run off from the orphan home. And we would hint that we were pausing for but a few days and then would be off to even more fabulous places and marvelous experiences. To help support the household, my grandmother boarded a colored school teacher, Ella, a young woman with so remote and dreamy and silent a manner that I was as much afraid of her as I was attracted to her. I had long wanted to ask her to tell me about the books that she was always reading, but I could never quite summon enough courage to do so. One afternoon I found her sitting alone upon the front porch, reading. Ella, I begged, please tell me what you are reading. It's just a book, she said evasively, looking about with apprehension. But what's it about? I asked. Your grandmother wouldn't like it if I talked to you about novels, she told me. I detected a note of sympathy in her voice. I don't care, I said loudly and bravely. Shh, you mustn't say things like that, she said, but I want to know. When you grow up, you'll read books and know what's in them, she explained. But I want to know now. She thought a while, then closed the book. Come here, she said. I sat at her feet and lifted my face to hers. Once upon a time, there was an old, old man named Bluebeard. She began in a low voice. She whispered to me the story of Bluebeard and his seven wives, and I ceased to see the porch, the sunshine, her face, everything. As her words fell upon my new ears, I endowed them with a reality that welled up from somewhere within me. She told how Bluebeard had duped and married his seven wives, how he had loved and slain them, how he had hanged them up by their hair in a dark closet. The tale made the world around me be throb, live. As she spoke, reality changed, the look of things altered, and the world became peopled with magical presences. My sense of life deepened and the feel of things was different, somehow. Enchanted and enthralled, I stopped her constantly to ask her details. My imagination blazed. The sensations the story aroused in me were never to leave me. When she was about to finish, when my interest was keenest, when I was lost to the world around me, Granny stepped briskly onto the porch. You stop that, you evil gal, she shouted. I want none of that devil stuff in my house. Her voice jarred me so that I gasped. For a moment I did not know what was happening. I, I, I'm sorry, Miss Wilson, Ella stammered, rising. But he asked me. He's just a foolish child and you know it, Granny blazed. Ella bowed her head and went into the house. But Granny, she didn't finish. I protested, knowing that I should have kept quiet. She bared her teeth and slapped me across my mouth with the back of her hand. You shut your mouth, she hissed. You don't know what you're talking about. But I want to hear what happened. I will, dodging another blow that I thought was coming. That's the devil's work, she shouted. My grandmother was as nearly white as a negro can get without being white, which means that she was white. 
The sagging flesh of her face quivered. Her eyes, large, dark, deep-set, wide apart, glared at me. Her lips narrowed to a line. Her high forehead wrinkled. When she was angry, her eyelids drooped halfway down over her pupils, giving her a baleful aspect. But I like the story, I told her. You're going to burn in hell, she said with such furious conviction that for a moment I believed her. Not to know the end of the tale filled me with a sense of emptiness, loss. I hungered for the sharp, frightening, breathtaking, almost painful excitement that the story had given me, and I vowed that as soon as I were old enough, I would buy all the novels there were and read them to feed that thirst for violence that was in me, for intrigue, for plotting, for secrecy, for bloody murders. So profoundly responsive a chord had the tale struck in me that the threats of my mother and grandmother had no effect whatsoever. They read my insistence as mere obstinacy, as foolishness, something that would quickly pass, and they had no notion how desperately serious the tale had made me. They could not have known that Ella's whispered story of deception and murder had been the first experience in my life that had elicited from me a total emotional response. No words or punishment could have possibly made me doubt. I had tasted what to me was life, and I would have more of it, somehow, some way. I realized that they could not understand what I was feeling, and I kept quiet. But when no one was looking, I would slip into Ella's room and steal a book and take it back to the barn and try to read it. Usually, I could not decipher enough words to make the story have meaning. I burned to learn to read novels, and I tortured my mother into telling me the meaning of every strange word I saw. Not because the word itself had any value, but because it was the gateway to a forbidden and enchanting land. One afternoon, my mother became so ill that she had to go to bed. When night fell, Granny assumed the task of seeing that my brother and I bathed. She set two tubs of water in our room and ordered us to pull off our clothes, which we did. She sat at one end of the room, knitting, lifting her eyes now and then from the wool to watch us and direct us. My brother and I splashed in the water, playing, laughing, trying our utmost to fling suds into each other's eyes. The floor was getting so sloppy that Granny scolded us. Stop that foolishness and wash yourselves. Yes, ma'am, we answered automatically and proceeded without playing. I scooped up a double handful of suds and called to my brother. He looked and I flung the suds, but he ducked and the white foam splattered onto the floor. Richard, stop that playing and bathe. Yes, ma'am, I said, watching my brother to catch him unawares so that I could fling more suds at him. Come here, you Richard, Granny said, putting her knitting aside. I went to her, walking sheepishly and nakedly across the floor. She snatched the towel from my hand and began to scrub my ears, my face, my neck. Bend over, she ordered. I stooped and she scrubbed my anus. My mind was in a sort of daze, midway between daydreaming and thinking. Then, before I knew it, words, words whose meaning I did not fully know, had slipped out of my mouth. When you get through, kiss back there, I said, the words rolling softly but unpremeditatedly. My first indication that something was wrong was that Granny became terribly still. Then she pushed me violently from her. I turned around and saw that her white face was frozen, that her black, deep-set eyes were blazing at me unblinkingly. Taking my cue from her queer expression, I knew that I had said something awful, but I had no notion at that moment just how awful it was. Granny rose slowly and lifted the wet towel high above her head and brought it down across my naked back 
with all the outraged fury of her sixty-odd-year-old body, leaving an aching streak of fire burning and quivering on my skin. I gasped and held my breath, fighting against the pain. Then I howled and cringed. I had not realized the meaning of what I had said. His moral horror was unfelt by me, and her attack seemed without cause. She lifted the wet towel and struck me again, with such force that I dropped to my knees. I knew that if I did not get out of her reach, she would kill me. Naked, I rose and ran out of the room, screaming. My mother hurried from her bed. "'What's the matter, Mama?' she asked Granny. I lingered in the hallway, trembling, looking at Granny, trying to speak, but only moving my lips. Granny seemed to have gone out of her mind, for she stood like stone, her eyes dead upon me, not saying a word. "'Richard, what have you done?' my mother asked. Poised to run again, I shook my head. "'What's the matter, for God's sake?' my mother asked of me, of Granny, of my brother, turning her face from one to another. Granny wilted, half-turned, flung the towel to the floor, then burst into tears. He... I was trying to wash him, Granny whimpered. Here, she continued pointing. And that black little devil... Her body was shaking with insult and rage. He told me to kiss him there when I was through. Now my mother stared without speaking. No! My mother exclaimed. He did, Granny whimpered. He didn't say that, my mother protested. He did, Granny sighed. I listened, vaguely knowing that I had committed some awful wrong that I could not undo. That I had uttered words I could not recall, even though I ached to nullify them, kill them, turn back time to the moment before I had talked so that I could have another chance to save myself. My mother picked up the wet towel and came toward me. I ran into the kitchen, naked, yelling. She came hard upon my heels and I scuttled into the backyard, running blindly in the dark, butting my head against the fence, the tree, bruising my toes on sticks of wood, still screaming. I had no way of measuring the gravity of my wrong and I assumed that I had done something for which I would never be forgiven. Had I known just how my words had struck them, I would have remained still and taken my punishment. But it was the feeling that anything could or would happen to me that made me wild with fear. Come here, you little filthy fool, my mother called. I dodged her and ran back into the house, then again into the hallway, my naked body flashing frantically through the air. I crouched in a dark corner. My mother rushed upon me, breathing hard. I ducked, crawled, stood, and ran again. You may as well stand still, my mother said. I'm going to beat you tonight if it is the last thing I do on this earth. Again she charged me and I dodged, just missing the sting swish of the wet towel, and scooted into the room where my brother stood. What's the matter? He asked, for he had not heard what I had said. A blow fell on my mouth. I whirled. Granny was upon me. She struck me another blow on my head with the back of her hand. Then my mother came into the room. I fell to the floor and crawled under the bed. You come out of there, my mother called. No, I cried. Come out or I'll beat you to within an inch of your life, she said. No, I said. Call Papa, Granny said. I trembled. Granny was sending my brother to fetch Grandpa, of whom I was mortally afraid. He was a tall, skinny, silent, grim black man who had fought in the Civil War with the Union Army. When he was angry, he gritted his teeth with a terrifying, grating sound. He kept his army gun in his room, standing in a corner, loaded. He was under the delusion that the war between the states would be resumed. 
I heard my brother rush out of the room, and I knew it was but a matter of minutes before Grandpa would come. I boiled myself into a knot and moaned. No, no, no. Grandma came and ordered me from under the bed. I refused to move. Come out of there, little man, he said. No. Do you want me to get my gun? No, sir. Please don't shoot me, I cried. Then come out. I remained still. Grandpa took hold of the bed and pulled it. I clung to a bedpost and was dragged over the floor. Grandpa ran at me and tried to grab my leg, but I crawled out of reach. I rested on all fours and kept in the center of the bed, and each time the bed moved, I moved following it. Come out and get your whipping, my mother called. I remained still. The bed moved and I moved. I did not think. I did not plan. I did not plot. Instinct told me what to do. There was painful danger, and I had to avoid it. Grandpa finally gave up and went back to his room. When you come out, you'll get your whipping, my mother said. No matter how long you stay under there, you're going to get it. And no food for you tonight. What did he do? My brother asked. Something he ought to be killed for, Granny said. But what? My brother asked. Shut up and get to bed, my mother said. I stayed under the bed far into the night. The household went to sleep. Finally, hunger and thirst drove me out. When I stood up, I found my mother lurking in the doorway, waiting for me. Come into the kitchen, she said. I followed her and she beat me, and she did not use the wet towel. Grandpa had forbade that. Between strokes of the switch, she would ask me where had I learned the dirty words and I could not tell her, and my inability to tell her made her furious. I'm going to beat you until you tell me, she declared, and I could not tell her because I did not know. None of the obscene words I had learned at school in Memphis had dealt with perversions of any sort, although I might have learned the words while loitering drunkenly in saloons. The next day, Granny said emphatically that she knew who had ruined me, that she knew I had learned about foul practices from reading Ella's books. And when I asked what foul practices were, my mother beat me afresh. No matter how hard I tried to convince them that I had not read the words in a book or that I could not remember having heard anyone say them, they would not believe me. Granny finally charged Ella with telling me things that I should not know, and Ella, weeping and distraught, packed her things and moved. The tremendous upheaval that my words had caused made me know that there lay back of them much more than I could figure out, and I resolved that in the future I would learn the meaning of why they had beat and denounced me. The days and hours began to speak now with a clearer tongue. Each experience had a sharp meaning of its own. There was the breathlessly anxious fun of chasing and catching flitting fireflies on drowsy summer nights. There was the drenching hospitality in the pervading smell of sweet magnolias. There was the aura of limitless freedom distilled from the rolling sweep of tall green grass swaying and glinting in the wind and sun. There was the feeling of impersonal plenty when I saw a bowl of cotton whose cup had split over and straggled its white fleece toward the earth. There was the pitying chuckle that bubbled in my throat when I watched a fat duck waddle across the backyard. There was the suspense I felt when I heard the taut, sharp song of a yellow black bee hovering nervously but patiently above a white rose. There was the drugged, sleepy feeling that came from sipping glasses of milk, drinking them slowly so that they would last a long time, and drinking enough for the first time in my life. There was the bitter amusement of going into town with Granny and watching the baffled stares of white folks 
who saw an old white woman leading two undeniably Negro boys in and out of stores on Capitol Street. There was the slow, fresh, saliva-stimulating smell of cooking cotton seeds. There was the excitement of fishing in muddy country creeks with my grandpa on cloudy days. There was the fear and awe I felt when grandpa took me to a sawmill to watch the giant whirring steel blades whine and scream as they bit into wet green logs. There was the puckery taste that almost made me cry when I ate my first half-ripe persimmon. There was the greedy joy in the tangy taste of wild hickory nuts. There was the dry hot summer morning when I scratched my bare arms on briars while picking blackberries and came home with my fingers and lips stained black with sweet berry juice. There was the relish of eating my first fried fish sandwich, nibbling at it slowly and hoping that I would never eat it up. There was the all-night ache in my stomach after I had climbed the neighbor's tree and eaten stolen, unripe peaches. There was the morning when I thought I would fall dead from fear after I had stepped with my bare feet upon a bright little green garden snake. And there were the long, slow, drowsy days and nights of drizzling rain. At last, we were at the railroad station with our bags, waiting for the train that would take us to Arkansas. And for the first time, I noticed that there were two lines of people at the ticket window, a white line and a black line. During my visit at Granny's, a sense of the two races had been born in me with a sharp concreteness that would never die until I died. When I boarded the train, I was aware that we Negroes were in one part of the train and that the whites were in another. Naively, I wanted to go and see how the whites looked while sitting in their part of the train. Can I go and peep at the white folks? I asked my mother. You keep quiet, she said. But that wouldn't be wrong, would it? Will you keep still? But why can't I? Quit talking foolishness. I had begun to notice that my mother became irritated when I questioned her about whites and blacks, and I could not quite understand it. I wanted to understand that these two sets of people who lived side by side and never touched, it seemed, except in violence. Now there was my grandmother. Was she white? Just how white was she? What did the whites think of her whiteness? Mama, is Granny white? I asked as the train rolled through the darkness. If you got eyes, you can see what color she is, my mother said. I mean, do the white folks think she's white? Why don't you ask the white folks that, she countered. But you know, I insisted. Why should I know? She asked. I'm not white. Granny looks white, I said, hoping to establish one fact at least. Then why is she living with us colored folks? Don't you want Granny to live with us? She asked, blunting my question. Yes. Then why are you asking? I want to know. Doesn't Granny live with us? Yes. Isn't that enough? But does she want to live with us? Why didn't you ask Granny that? My mother evaded me again in a taunting voice. Did Granny become colored when she married Grandpa? Will you stop asking silly questions? But did she? Granny didn't become colored, my mother said angrily. She was born the color she is now. 
again I was being shut out of the secret. The thing. The reality I felt somewhere beneath all the words and silences. Why didn't Granny marry a white man? I asked. Because she didn't want to. My mother said peevishly. Why don't you want to talk to me? I asked. She slapped me and I cried. Later, grudgingly, she told me that Granny came of Irish, Scotch, and French stock in which Negro blood had somewhere and somehow been infused. She explained it all in a matter-of-fact, offhand, neutral way. Her emotions were not involved at all. What was Granny's name before she married Grandpa? Bolden. Who gave her that name? The white man who owned her. She was a slave? Yes. And Bolden was the name of Granny's father? Granny doesn't know who her father was. So they just gave her any name? They gave her a name. That's all I know. Couldn't Granny find out who her father was? For what, silly? So she could know. No, for what? Just to know. But for what? I could not say. I could not get anywhere. Mama, where did father get his name? From his father. And where did the father of my father get his name? Like Granny got hers. From a white man. Do they know who he is? I don't know. Why don't they find out? For what? My mother demanded harshly. And I could think of no rational or practical reason why my father should try to find out who his father's father was. What has Papa got in him? I asked. Some white and some red and some black, she said. Indian, white, and Negro? Yes. Then what am I? They'll call you a colored man when you grow up, she said. Then she turned to me and smiled mockingly and asked, Do you mind, Mr. Wright? I was angry and I did not answer. I did not object to being called colored, but I knew that there was something my mother was holding back. She was not concealing facts, but feelings, attitudes, convictions, which she did not want me to know. And she became angry when I prodded her. All right, I will find out some day. Just wait. All right, I, I was colored. It was fine. I did not know enough to be afraid or to anticipate in a concrete manner. True, I had heard that colored people were killed and beaten, but so far it all had seemed remote. There was, of course, a vague uneasiness about it all. But I would be able to handle that when I came to it. It would be simple. If anybody tried to kill me, then I would kill them first. When we arrived in Elaine, I saw that Aunt Maggie lived in a bungalow that had a fence around it. It looked like a home and I was glad. I had no suspicion that I was to live here for but a short time and that the manner of my leaving would be my first baptism of racial emotion. A wide dusty road ran past the house and on each side of the road wild flowers grew. It was summer and the smell of clay dust was everywhere, day and night. I would get up early morning to wade with my bare feet through the dust of the road reveling in the strange mixture of the cold dew-wet crust on the top of the road and the warm sun-baked dust beneath. After sunrise, the bees would come out, and I discovered that by slapping my two palms together smartly, I could kill a bee. My mother warned me to stop, telling me that bees made honey, that it was not good to kill things that made food, that I would eventually be stung. But I felt confident of outwitting any bee. One morning I slapped an enormous bee between my hands, just as it had lit upon a flower, and it stung me in the tender center of my left palm. 
I ran home screaming. Good enough for you, my mother commented dryly. I never crushed any more bees. Aunt Maggie's husband, Uncle Hoskind, owned a saloon that catered to the hundreds of Negroes who worked in the surrounding sawmills. Remembering the saloon of my Memphis days, I begged Uncle Hoskins to take me to see it, and he promised, but my mother said no. She was afraid that I would grow up to be a drunkard if I went inside of a saloon again while still a child. Well, if I could not see the saloon, at least I could eat, and at mealtime Aunt Maggie's table was so loaded with food that I could scarcely believe it was real. It took me some time to get used to the idea of there being enough to eat. I felt that if I ate enough there would not be anything left for another time. When I first sat down at Aunt Maggie's table, I could not eat until I asked, Can I eat all I want? Eat as much as you like, Uncle Hoskins said. I did not believe him. I ate until my stomach hurt, but even then, I did not want to get up from the table. Your eyes are bigger than your stomach, my mother said. Let him eat all he wants, too, and get used to food, Uncle Hoskins said. When supper was over, I saw that there were many biscuits piled high upon the bread platter. An astonishing and unbelievable sight to me. Though the biscuits were right before my eyes, and though there was more flour in the kitchen, I was apprehensive lest there be no bread for breakfast in the morning. I was afraid that somehow the biscuits might disappear during the night while I was sleeping. I did not want to wake up in the morning, as I had so often in the past, feeling hungry and knowing that there was no food in the house. So, surreptitiously, I took some of the biscuits from the platter and slipped them into my pocket. Not to eat, but to keep as a bulwark against any possible attack of hunger. Even after I had got used to seeing the table loaded with food at each meal, I still stole bread and put it into my pockets. And washing my clothes, my mother found the gummy wads and scolded me to break me of the habit. I stopped hiding the bread in my pockets and hid it about the house and corners behind dressers. I did not break the habit of stealing and hoarding bread until my faith that food would be forthcoming at each meal had been somewhat established. Uncle Hoskins had a horse and buggy and sometimes he used to take me with him to Helena where he traded. One day when I was riding with him he said, Richard, will you like to see this horse drink water out of the middle of the river? <laughs> yes, I said laughing. But this horse can't do that. Yes, he can, Uncle Hoskins said. Just wait and see. He lashed the horse and headed the buggy straight for the Mississippi River. Where are you going? I asked, alarm mounting in me. We're going to the middle of the river so the horse can drink, he said. He drove over the levee and down the long slope of cobblestones to the river's edge, and the horse plunged wildly in. I looked at the mild stretch of water that lay ahead and leaped up in terror. Ah! This horse has to drink, Uncle Hoskins said grimly. This river's deep, I shouted. The horse can't drink here, Uncle Hoskins said, lashing the back of the struggling animal. The buggy went farther. The horse slowed a little and tossed his head above the current. I grabbed the sides of the buggy, ready to jump, even though I could not swim. Sit down or you'll fall out, Uncle Hoskins shouted. Let me out, I screamed. The water now came up to the hubs of the wheels of the buggy. I tried to leap into the river and he caught hold of my legs. We were now surrounded by water. Let me out, 
I screamed. The buggy rolled on and the water rose higher. The horse wagged his head, arched his neck, flung his tail about, walled his eyes and snorted. I gripped the sides of the buggy with all the strength I had, ready to wrench free and leap if the buggy slipped deeper into the river. Uncle Hoskins and I tussled. Whoa! He yelled at last to the horse. The horse stopped and neighed. The swirling yellow water was so close that I could have touched the surface of the river. Uncle Hoskins looked at me and laughed. Did you really think I was going to drive this buggy into the middle of the river? He asked. I was too scared to answer. My muscles were so taut that they ached. It's all right, he said soothingly. He turned the buggy around and started back toward the levee. I was still clutching the sides of the buggy so tightly that I could not turn them loose. We're safe now, he said. The buggy rolled on to dry land, and as my fear ebbed, I felt that I was dropping from a great height. It seemed that I could smell a sharp, fresh odor. My forehead was damp, and my heart thumped heavily. I want to get out, I said. What's the matter? he asked. I want to get out. We're back on land now, boy. No, stop. I want to get out. He did not stop the buggy. He did not even turn his head to look at me. He did not understand. I wrenched my leg free with a lunge and leaped headlong out of the buggy, landing in the dust of the road, unhurt. He stopped the buggy. Are you really that scared? He asked softly. I did not answer. I could not speak. My fear was gone now, and he loomed before me like a stranger, like a man I had never seen before, a man with whom I could never share a moment of intimate living. Come on, Richard, and get back into the buggy, he said. I'll take you home now. I shook my head and began to cry. Listen, son, don't you trust me? He asked. I was born on that old river. I know that river. There's stone and brick way down under that water. You could wade out a half a mile and it would not come over your head. His words meant nothing and I would not re-enter the buggy. I'd better take you home, he said soberly. I started down a dusty road. He got out of the buggy and walked beside me. He did not do his shopping that day, and when he tried to explain to me what he had been trying to do in frightening me, I would not listen or speak to him. I never trusted him after that. Whenever I saw his face, the memory of my terror upon the river would come back, vivid and strong, and it stood as a barrier between us. Each day, Uncle Hoskins went into his saloon in the evenings and did not return home until the early hours of the morning. Like my father, he slept in the daytime, but noise never seemed to bother Uncle Hoskins. My brother and I shouted and banged as much as we liked. Often I would creep into his room while he slept and stare at the big shining revolver that lay near his head, within quick reach of his hand. I asked Aunt Maggie why he kept the gun so close to him and she told me that men had threatened to kill him. White men. One morning I awakened to learn that Uncle Hoskins had not come home from the saloon. Aunt Maggie fretted and worried. She wanted to visit the saloon and find out what had happened. But Uncle Hoskins had forbidden her to come to the place. The day wore on and dinner time came. I'm going to find out if anything's happened, Aunt Maggie said. Maybe you oughtn't, my mother said. Maybe it's dangerous. The food was kept hot on the stove and Aunt Maggie stood on the front porch, staring into the deepening dusk. Again, she declared that she was going to the saloon, but my mother dissuaded her once more. It grew dark and still he had not come. Aunt Maggie was silent and restless. I hope to God the white people don't bother him, she said. 
Later, she went into the bedroom, and when she came out, she whimpered. He didn't take his gun. I wonder what could have happened. We ate in silence. An hour later, there was the sound of heavy footsteps on the front porch, and a loud knock came. Aunt Maggie ran to the door and flung it open. A tall black boy stood, sweating, panting, and shaking his head. He pulled off his cap. Mr. Hoskins, he done been shot. Done been shot by a white man. The boy gasped. Miss Hoskins, he dead. Aunt Maggie screamed and rushed off the porch and down the dusty road into the night. Maggie! My mother screamed. Don't you all go to that saloon, the boy called. Maggie! My mother called, running after Aunt Maggie. They'll kill you if you go there, the boy yelled. White folks say they'll kill all his kin folks. My mother pulled Aunt Maggie back into the house. Fear drowned out grief, and that night we packed clothes and dishes and loaded them into a farmer's wagon. Before dawn, we were rolling away, fleeing for our lives. I learned afterwards that Uncle Hoskins had been killed by whites who had long coveted his flourishing liquor business. He had been threatened with death and warned many times to leave, but he had wanted to hold on a while longer to amass more money. We got rooms in West Helena, and Aunt Maggie and my mother kept huddled in the house all day and night, afraid to be seen on the streets. Finally, Aunt Maggie defied her fear and made frequent trips back to Elaine, but she went in secret, and at night, and would tell no one save my mother when she was going. There was no funeral. There was no music. There was no period of mourning. There were no flowers. There were only silence. Quiet weeping, whispers, and fear. I did not know when or where Uncle Hoskins was buried. Aunt Maggie was not even allowed to see his body, nor was she able to claim any of his assets. Uncle Hoskins had simply been plucked from our midst, and we, figuratively, had fallen on our faces to avoid looking into that white hot face of terror that we knew loomed somewhere above us. This was as close as white terror had ever come to me, and my mind reeled. Why had we not fought back? I asked my mother, and the fear that was in her made her slap me into silence. Shocked, frightened, alone without their husbands or friends, my mother and Aunt Maggie lost faith in themselves, and, after much debate and hesitation, they decided to return home to Granny and rest, think, map out new plans for living. I had grown used to moving suddenly, and the prospects of another trip did not excite me. I had learned to leave old places without regret and to accept new ones for what they look like. Though I was nearly nine years of age, I had not had a single unbroken year of school, and I was not conscious of it. I could read and count, and that was about as much as most of the people I met could do, grown-ups or children. Again, our household was torn apart. Belongings were sold, given away, or simply left behind, and we were off for another long train ride. A few days later, after we had arrived at Granny's, I was playing alone in a wild field, 
digging in the ground with an old knife. Suddenly, a strange rhythmic sound made me turn my head. Flowing threateningly toward me over the crest of a hill was a wave of black men draped in weird, mustard-colored clothing. Unconsciously, I jumped to my feet, my heart pounding. What was this? Were these men coming after me? Line by line, row by row, the fantastic men in their wild colors were descending straight at me, trotting, their feet pounding the earth like someone beating a vast drum. I wanted to fly home, but, as in a dream, I could not move. I cast about wildly for a clue to tell me what this was, but I could find nothing. The wall of men was drawing closer. My heart was beating so strongly that it shook my body. Again I tried to run, but I could not budge. My mother's name was on the tip of my tongue, and I opened my mouth to scream, but no words came. For now, the surging men, each looking exactly like the other, parted and poured around me, jarring the earth, their feet stomping in unison. As they flooded past, I saw that their black faces were looking at me, and that some of them were smiling. Then I noticed that each man was holding a long, dark, heavy, stick-like object upon his shoulder. One of the men yelled something at me, which I did not understand. They were past me now, disappearing in a great cloud of brown dust that looked like a part of their clothing, that made them seem akin to the elemental earth itself. As soon as they were far enough away for me to conquer my fear, I dashed home and babbled to my mother what I had seen, asking her who the strange men were. Those were soldiers, she said. What are soldiers? I asked. Men who fight in wars. Why do they fight? Because their country tells them to. And what are those long black sticks they have on their shoulders? Rifles. What's a rifle? It's a gun that shoots a bullet. Like a pistol? Yes. Would the bullet kill you? Yes, if it hits you in the right place. Who are they going to shoot? Germans. Who are Germans? They are the enemy. What's an enemy? The people who want to kill you and take your country away from you. Where do they live? Way across the sea, my mother explained. Don't you remember that I told you when war has been declared? I remembered, but when she had told me, it had not seemed at all important. I asked my mother what the war was about, and she spoke of England, France, Russia, Germany, of men dying, but the reality of it was too vast and alien for me to be moved or further interested. Upon another day, I was playing out of doors in front of the house, and I accidentally looked down the road and saw what seemed to me to be a herd of elephants coming slowly toward me. It was in me this time none of that naked terror I had felt when I had seen the soldiers, for these strange creatures were moving slowly, silently, with no suggestion of threat. Yet I edged cautiously toward the steps of the house holding myself ready to run if they should prove to be more violent than they appeared. The strange elephants were a few feet from me now, and I saw that their faces were like the faces of men. I stared, my mind trying to adjust memory to reality. What kind of men were these? I saw that there were two lines of creatures that looked like men on either side of the road, that there were a few white faces and a great many black faces. I saw that the white faces were the faces of white men and they were dressed in ordinary clothing. But the black faces were men wearing what seemed to be elephant's clothing. As the strange animals came abreast of me, 
I saw that the legs of the black animals were held together by irons, and that their arms were linked with heavy chains that clanked softly and musically as they moved. The black creatures were digging a shallow ditch on each side of the road, working silently, grunting as they lifted spades of earth and flung them into the middle of the roadway. One of the strange striped animals turned a black face upon me. What are you doing? I asked in a whisper, not knowing if one actually spoke to elephants. He shook his head and cast his eyes guardedly back at a white man, then dug on again. Suddenly, I noticed that the white men were holding the long, heavy black sticks, rifles, on their shoulders. After they had passed, I ran breathlessly into the house. Mama! I yelled. What? She answered from the kitchen. There were elephants in the street. She came to the kitchen door and stared at me. The elephants? She asked. Yes, come and see them. They're digging the street. My mother dried her hands on her apron and rushed to the front door. I followed, wanting her to interpret the baffling spectacle I had seen. She looked out of the door and shook her head. Those are not elephants, she said. What are they? That's a chain gang. What's a chain gang? It's just what you see, she said. A gang of men chained together and made to work. Why? Because they've done something wrong and they're being punished. What did they do? I don't know. But why do they look like that? That's to keep them from running away, she said. You see, everybody will know that they're convicts because of their stripes. Why don't the white men wear stripes? They're the guards. Do white men ever wear stripes? Sometimes. Did you ever see any? No. Why are there so many black men wearing stripes? It's because, uh, well, well, they're, they're hard on black people. The white people? Yes. Then why don't all the black men fight all the white men out there? There are more black men than white men. But the white men have guns and the black men don't, my mother said. She looked at me and asked, What may you call them elephants? I could not answer her at the moment, but later, brooding over the black and white striped clothing of the black men, I remembered that in Elaine I had a book that carried the gaudy pictures and names of jungle beasts. What had struck me most vividly were the striped zebras that looked as if someone had painted them. The other animals that had gripped my imagination were the elephants, and by association, the zebras and the elephants had become linked and identified in my mind to such an extent that when I had seen the convicts dressed in the white and black stripes of zebras, I had thought they were elephants, beasts of the jungle. Again, after an undetermined stretch of time, my mother announced that we were going to move that we were going back to West Helena. She had grown tired of the strict religious routine of Granny's home, of the half dozen or more daily family prayers that Granny insisted upon. Her fiat that the day began at sunrise and that night commenced at sundown, the long rambling Bible readings, the individual invocations muttered at each meal, and her declaration that Saturday was the Lord's Sabbath and that no one who lived in her house could work upon that day. In West Helena, we could have a home of our own, a condition that now loomed desirable after a few months of Granny's anxiety about the state of our souls. Naturally, a trip was agreeable to me. Again, we packed. 
Again we said goodbye. Again we rode the train. Again we were in West Helena. We rented one half of a double corner house in front of which ran a stagnant ditch carrying sewage. The neighborhood swarmed with rats, cats, dogs, fortune tellers, cripples, blind men, whores, salesmen, rent collectors, and children. In front of our flat was a huge roundhouse where locomotives were cleaned and repaired. There was an eternal hissing of steam, the deep grunting of steel engines, and the tolling of bells. Smoke obscured the vision, and cinders drifted into the house, into our beds, into our kitchen, into our food, and a tar-like smell was always in the air. Bareheaded and barefooted, my brother and I, along with nameless and countless other black children, used to stand and watch the men crawl in, out, over and under the huge black metal engines. When the men were not looking, we would climb into the engineer's cab and pull our small bodies to the window and look out, imagining that we were grown and had got a job as an engineer running a train, and that it was night and there was a storm, and we had a long string of passenger cars behind us trying to get them safely home. Woo wee, we would say. Dong 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 huff, 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 we would say. But our greatest fun came from wading in the sewage ditch where we found old bottles, tin cans that held tiny crawfish, rusty spoons, bits of metal, old toothbrushes, dead cats and dogs, and occasional pennies. We made wooden bolts out of cigar boxes devised wooden paddles to which we twisted pieces of rubber and sent the cigar box boats sailing down the ditch under their own power. Many evenings the fathers of the children would come out, take off their shoes, and make and sail the boats themselves. My mother and Aunt Maggie cooked in the kitchens of white folks, and my brother and I were free to wander where we pleased during their working hours. Each day we were left a dime apiece to spend for lunch, and all morning we would dream and discuss what we would buy. At ten or eleven o'clock, we would go to the corner grocery, owned by a Jew, and buy a nickel's worth of ginger snaps and a bottle of Coca-Cola. That was lunch as we understood it. I had never seen a Jew before, and the proprietor of the corner grocery was a strange thing in my life. Until that time I had never heard a foreign language spoken and I saw of the corner grocery to hear the odd sounds that Jews made when they talked. All of us black people who lived in the neighborhood hated Jews. Not because they exploited us but because we had been taught at home and in Sunday school that Jews were Christ killers. With the Jews thus singled out for us we made them fair game for ridicule. We black children, seven, eight, and nine years of age, used to run to the Jew store and shout, Jew, 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 what do you chew? Or we would form a long line and weave back and forth in front of the door singing, Jew, Jew, two for five, that's what keeps Jew alive. Or we would chant, Bloody Christ killers, never trust a Jew, bloody Christ killers, what won't a Jew do? To one of the redhead Jewish boys we sang, Redhead Jewish bread, five cents a Jewish head. To the fat Jewish woman we sneered, Red, white, and blue, your pa was a Jew, your ma a dirty day go, what the hell is you? And when the bald-headed proprietor would pass by, we black children, poor, half-starved, ignorant, victims of racial prejudice, would sing with a proud lilt. A rotten egg never fries, a cheating dog never thrives. There were many more folk ditties, some mean, others filthy, all of them cruel. No one ever thought of questioning our right to do this, 
Our mothers and parents generally approved, either actively or passively. To hold an attitude of antagonism or distrust toward Jews was bred in us from childhood. It was not merely racial prejudice, it was a part of our cultural heritage. One afternoon, a group of black boys and girls were standing about outside playing, laughing, talking. A black man dressed in overalls went up the steps and into the flat adjoining the one in which I lived. This is Saturday, a black girl said to me. Yeah, but why you say it? I asked. They gonna make a lot of money in there today, she said, pointing to the door through which the man had disappeared. How? Another black man went up the steps and into the flat. Don't you know? The girl asked, incredulous. Know what? What they selling? Where? In there where them men went, she said. Nobody sells things in there, I said. You kidding? The girl said in honest disbelief. I ain't what they selling. Tell me. You know what they selling? She said, looking at me with a teasing smile. They don't sell nothing in there, I said. Oh, you just a baby, she said, slapping her dingy palm through the air at me in a contemptuous gesture. I was puzzled. Was there something happening next door to where I lived that I did not know? I thought I had poked my nose into every bit of conceivable business in the neighborhood. If something was being sold next door, then I certainly wanted to know about it. The building in which I lived was a double frame house of one story. The building originally had been a one dwelling unit and had been converted into two flats. For there were doors in our flat that led into the flat adjoining. These doors had been locked, bolted, and nailed securely. The family next door seemed quiet. Men came and went, but that did not seem odd to me. But now the girl's hints made me want to know what was happening over there. I entered our house and locked the door, then put my ear to the thin wall that divided the two flats and listened. I heard faint sounds but could make nothing of them. I listened at a bolted door and the sounds came a little louder, but I still could understand nothing. Quietly I pulled up a chair, placed a box upon it and climbed up and peered through a crack at the top of the door. I saw in the dim shadows of the room beyond a naked man and a naked woman upon a bed the man on top of the woman. I lost my balance and toppled backwards to the floor. I lay still, wondering if the man and woman next door had heard me. But all seemed quiet, and my curiosity returned. Just as I had climbed up again to look, a sharp rapping came on the window pane behind me. I turned my head and saw the landlady from next door looking at me. My heart thumped and I scrambled down. The landlady's black face was pressed hard against the window pane. Her mouth was moving violently and her eyes were glaring. I was afraid to stay in the house or go out. Why had I not thought of lowering the shade? Evidently, I had done something terrible, if the wild anger written on the woman's face was any indication. Her face went from the window and a moment later a loud pounding came at the front door. Open this door, you boy! I trembled and did not answer. Open this door, or I'll have to break it. My mama ain't here, I said vaguely. This is my house, and you open this door, she shouted. Her voice overpowered me, and I opened the door. She rushed in, then stopped and stared at the clumsy scaffolding I had rigged up to look into her flat. Why hadn't I take it down before I opened the door? Boy, what do you mean? She asked. I could not answer. You scared my customers, she said. Customers? I repeated vaguely. 
you little snoop, she blazed. I got a good mind to beat you. Now you won't, I said. I'm gonna make your folks move out of here, she railed. I got to make a living, and you go and spoil my Saturday for me. I, 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 was, I was just looking. Looking? She smiled suddenly, relenting a little. Why don't you come on over like the rest and spend a quarter? I don't want to go into your old house, I told her with my nine-year-old indignation. You're a plague, she said, deciding that I would not be a customer. I'm going to get you out of here. When my mother and Aunt Maggie came home that night, there was a scalding argument. The women shouted at each other over the wooden railings on the front porch, and their voices could be heard for half a mile. Neighbors listened. Children gathered and gaped. The argument boiled down to one issue. The landlady demanded that my mother beat me, and for once, my mother refused. You ought to have that in your house, my mother told her. It's my house, and I have in it what I damn please, the landlady said. I wouldn't have moved in here if I had thought you were running that kind of business, my mother said. Don't talk to me like that, you high-toned bitch, the landlady shouted. What do you expect children to do when you do that, my mother asked. Them bastard brats of yours ain't no angels, the landlady said. You're just a common prostitute, Aunt Maggie pitched in. And what kind of whore is you, the landlady shouted. Don't you talk to my sister like that, my mother warned. Pack up your rags, you black bastards, and get, the landlady ordered. It ended with our packing and moving that night into another frame house on the same street, a few doors away. I still had only a hazy notion of what the landlady was selling. The boys later told me the name of it, but I had no exact conception of it in my mind though I knew that others felt it was something terribly bad I was still curious in time I would find out what it was something secret was happening in our house and it had reached a serious stage before I knew it each night just as I was dozing off to sleep I would hear a light tapping on Aunt Maggie's window pane a door creeping open whispers then long silences once I got out of bed and crept to the door of the front room and stole a look. There was a well-dressed black man sitting on the sofa talking in a soft voice to Aunt Maggie. Why was it that I could not meet the man? I crept back into bed but was awakened later by low voices saying goodbye. The next morning I asked my mother who had been in the house and she told me that no one had been there. But I heard a man talking, I said. You didn't? She said. You were sleeping. But I saw a man. He was in the front room. You were dreaming, my mother said. I learned a part of the secret of the night visits. One Sunday morning when Aunt Maggie called me and my brother to her room and introduced us to the man who was going to be our new uncle, a Professor Matthews. He wore a high, snow-white collar and rimless eyeglasses. His lips were thin, and his eyelids seemed never to blink. I felt something cold and remote in him, and when he called me, I would not go to him. He sensed my distrust and softened me up with the gift of a dime, then knelt and prayed for us two poor fatherless young men, as he called us. After prayer, Aunt Maggie told us that she and Professor Matthews were leaving soon for the North. I was saddened, for I had grown to feel that Aunt Maggie was another mother to me. I did not meet the new uncle again, though each morning I saw evidences of his leaving the house. 
My brother and I were puzzled, and we speculated as to what our new uncle could be doing. Why did he always come at night? Why did he always speak in so subdued a voice, hardly above a whisper? And how did he get the money to buy such white collars and such nice blue shirts? To add to our bewilderment, our mother called us to her one day and cautioned us against telling anyone that uncle ever visited us, that people were looking for uncle. What people? I asked. White people, my mother said. Anxiety entered my body. Somewhere in the unknown, the white threat was hovering near again. What do they want with him? I asked. You never mind, my mother said. What did he do? You keep your mouth shut or the white folks will get you too, she warned me. Knowing that we were frightened and baffled about our new uncle, my mother, I guess, urged Aunt Maggie to tell uncle to bribe us into silence and trust. Every morning now was like Christmas. We would climb out of bed and race to the kitchen and look on the table to see what uncle had left for us. One morning I found that he had brought me a little female poodle, upon which I bestowed the name of Betsy, and she became my pet and companion. Strangely, Uncle began visiting us in the daytime now, but when he came, all the shades in the house were drawn, and we were forbidden to go out of doors until he left. I asked my mother a thousand whispered questions about the silent, black, educated Uncle, and she always replied, it's something you can't know. Now keep quiet and go play. One night the sound of sobbing awakened me. I got up and went softly to the front room and peeped around the jam of the door. There was Uncle sitting on the floor by the window, peering into the night from under the lifted curtain. My mother was bent over a small trunk, packing hurriedly. Fear gripped me. Was my mother leaving? Why was Aunt Maggie crying? Were the white people coming after us? Hurry up, Uncle said. We must get out of here. Oh, Maggie, my mother said. I don't know if you ought to go. You keep out of this, Uncle said, still peering into the dark street. But what did you do? Aunt Maggie asked. I'll tell you later, Uncle said. We got to get out of here before they come. But you've done something terrible, Aunt Maggie said, or you wouldn't be running like this. The house is on fire, Uncle said, and when they see it, they'll know who did it. Did you set a house afire? My mother asked. There was nothing else to do. Uncle said impatiently, I took the money. I had hit her. She was unconscious. If they found her, she'd tell. I'd be lost. So I set the fire. But she'll burn up, Aunt Maggie said, crying into her hands. What could I do? Uncle asked. I had to do it. I couldn't just leave her there and let somebody find her. They know somebody hit her. But if she burns, nobody ever know. Fear filled me. What was happening? Were white people coming after all of us? Was my mother going to leave me? Mama! I wailed, running into the room. Uncle leapt to his feet. A gun was in his hand, and he was pointing it at me. I stared at the gun feeling that I was going to die at any moment. Richard, my mother whispered fiercely. You're going away, I yelled. My mother rushed to me and clapped her hand over my mouth. Do you want us all to be killed? She asked, shaking me. I quieted. Now you go back to sleep, she said. You're leaving. I'm not. You're leaving. I, I see the trunk, I wailed. 
You stop that noise, my mother said. And she caught my arms in so tight a grip of fury that my crying ceased because of the pain. Now you get back in bed. She led me back to the bed and I lay awake, listening to whispers, footsteps, doors creaking in the dark, and the sobs of Aunt Maggie. Finally, I heard the sound of a horse and buggy rolling up to the house. I heard the scraping of a trunk being dragged across the floor. Aunt Maggie came into my room, crying softly. She kissed me and whispered goodbye. She kissed my brother, who did not even waken. Then she was gone. The next morning, my mother called me into the kitchen and talked to me for a long time cautioning me that I must never mention what I had seen and heard. That white people would kill me if they even thought I knew. Know what? I could not help but ask. Never mind you now, she said. Forget what you saw last night. But what did uncle do? I can't tell you. He killed somebody? I ventured timidly. If anybody heard you say that, you'll die, my mother said. That settled it for me. I would never mention it. A few days later, a tall white man with a gleaming star on his chest and a gun on his hip came to the house. He talked with my mother a long time and all I could hear was my mother's voice. I don't know what you're talking about. Search the house if you like. The tall white man looked at me and my brother. But he said nothing to us. For weeks I wondered what it was that uncle had done. But I was destined never to know. Not even in all the years that followed. With Aunt Maggie gone, my mother could not earn enough to feed us. And my stomach kept so consistently empty that my head ached most of the day. One afternoon, hunger haunted me so acutely that I decided to try to sell my dog Betsy and buy some food. Betsy was a tiny, white, fluffy poodle, and when I had washed, dried, and combed her, she looked like a toy. I tucked her under my arm and went for the first time alone into a white neighborhood where there were wide, clean streets and big white houses. I went from door to door, ringing the bells. Some white people slammed the door in my face. Others told me, to come to the rear of the house but pride would never let me do that finally a young white woman came to the door and smiled what do you want she asked do you want to buy a pretty dog I asked let me see it she took the dog into her arms and fondled and kissed it what's its name Betsy she is cute, she said. What do you want for her? A dollar, I asked. Wait a moment, she said. Let me see if I have a dollar. She took Betsy into the house with her and I waited on the porch, marveling at the cleanliness, the quietness of the white world. How orderly everything was, yet I felt out of place. I had no desire to live here. Then I remembered that these houses were the homes in which lived those white people who made Negroes leave their homes and flee into the night. I grew tense. Would someone say that I was a bad nigger and try to kill me here? What was keeping the woman so long? Would she tell other people that a nigger boy had said something wrong to her? Perhaps she was getting a mob. Maybe I ought to leave now and forget about Betsy. My mounting anxieties drowned out my hunger. I wanted to rush back to the safety of the black faces I knew. The door opened and the woman came out, smiling, still hugging Betsy in her arms. But I could not see her smile now. My eyes were full of the fears I had conjured up. I just love this dog she said and I'm going to buy her I haven't got a dollar all I have is 97 cents though she did not know it 
She was now giving me my opportunity to ask for my dog without saying that I did not want to sell her to white people. No, ma'am, I said softly. I want a dollar. But I haven't got a dollar in the house, she said. Then I can't sell the dog, I said. I'll give you the other three cents when my mother comes home tonight, she said. No, ma'am, I said, looking stonily at the floor. But listen, you said you wanted a dollar. Yes, ma'am, a dollar. Then here is ninety-seven cents, she said, extending a handful of change to me, still holding on to Betsy. No, ma'am, I said, shaking my head, I want a dollar. But I'll give you the other three cents. My mama told me to sell her for a dollar, I said, feeling that I was being too aggressive and trying to switch the moral blame for my aggressiveness to my absent mother. You'll get a dollar. You'll get the three cents tonight. No, ma'am. Then leave the dog and come back tonight. No, ma'am. But what could you want with a dollar now? She asked. I want to buy something to eat, I said. Then ninety-seven cents will buy you a lot of food, she said. No, ma'am, I, I want my dog. She stared at me for a moment, and her face grew red. Here's your dog, she snapped, thrusting Betsy into my arms. Now get away from here. You're just about the craziest nigger boy I ever did see. I took Betsy and ran all the way home, glad that I had not sold her, but my hunger returned. Maybe I ought to have taken the ninety-seven cents, but it was too late now. I hugged Betsy in my arms and waited. When my mother came home that night, I told her what had happened. And you didn't take the money? She asked. No, ma'am. Why? I don't know, I said uneasily. Don't you know that ninety-seven cents is almost a dollar? She asked. Yes, ma'am, I said, counting on my fingers. Ninety-eight, ninety-nine, one hundred... But I didn't want to sell Betsy to white people. Why? Because they're white, I said. You're foolish, my mother said. A week later, Betsy was crushed to death beneath the wheels of a coal wagon. I cried and buried her in the backyard and drove a barrel staving into the ground at the head of a grave. My mother's sole comment was, You could have had a dollar. But you can't eat a dead dog, can you? I did not answer. Up or down the wet or dusty streets, indoors or out, the days and nights began to spell out magic possibilities. If I pulled the hair from a horse's tail and sealed it in a jar of my own urine, the hair would turn overnight into a snake. If I passed a Catholic sister or mother dressed in black, and smiled and allowed her to see my teeth, I would surely die. If I walked under a leaning ladder, I would certainly have bad luck. If I kissed my elbow, I would turn into a girl. If my right ear itched, then something good was being said about me by somebody. If I touched that hunchback's hump, then I would never be sick. If I placed a safety pin on a steel railroad track and let a train run over it, the safety pin would turn into a pair of bright brand new scissors. If I heard a voice and no human being was near, then either God or the devil was trying to talk to me. Whenever I made urine, I should spit into it for good luck. If my nose itched, Somebody was going to visit me. If I mocked a crippled man, then God will make me crippled. If I used the name of God in vain, then God would strike me dead. If it rained while the sun was shining, then the devil was beating his wife. If the stars twinkled more than usual on any given night, 
it meant that the angels in heaven were happy and were flitting across the floors of heaven. And since stars were merely holes ventilating heaven, the twinkling came from the angels flitting past the holes that admitted air into the holy home of God. If I broke a mirror, I would have seven years of bad luck. If I was good to my mother, I would grow old and rich. If I had a cold and tied a worn, dirty sock about my throat before I went to bed, the cold would be gone the next morning. If I wore a bit of asafetida in a little bag tied about my neck, I would never catch a disease. If I looked at the sun through a piece of smoked glass on Easter Sunday morning, I would see the sun shouting in praise of a risen Lord. If a man confessed anything on his deathbed, it was the truth, for no man could stare death in the face and lie. If you spat on each grain of corn that was planted, the corn would grow tall and bear well. If I split salt, I should toss a pinch over my left shoulder to ward off misfortune. If I covered a mirror when a storm was raging, the lightning would not strike me. If I stepped over a broom that was lying on the floor, I would have bad luck. If I walked in my sleep, then God was trying to lead me somewhere to do a good deed for him. Anything seemed possible, likely, feasible, because I wanted everything to be possible. Because I had no power to make things happen outside of me in the objective world, I made things happen within. Because my environment was bare and bleak, I endowed it with unlimited potentialities, redeemed it for the sake of my own hungry and cloudy yearning. A dread of white people now came to live permanently in my feelings and imaginations. As the war drew to a close, racial conflict flared over the entire South, and though I did not witness any of it, I could not have been more thoroughly affected by it if I had participated directly in every clash. The war itself had been unreal to me, but I had grown able to respond emotionally to every hint, whisper, word, inflection, news, gossip, and rumor regarding conflicts between the races. Nothing challenged the totality of my personality so much as this pressure of hate and threat that stemmed from the invisible whites. I would stand for hours on the doorsteps of neighbors' houses, listening to their talk, learning how a white woman had slapped a black woman, how a white man had killed a black man. It filled me with awe, wonder, and fear, and I asked ceaseless questions. One evening, I heard a tale that rendered me sleepless for nights. It was of a Negro woman whose husband had been seized and killed by a mob. It was claimed that the woman vowed she would avenge her husband's death, and she took a shotgun, wrapped it in a sheet, and went humbly to the whites, pleading that she be allowed to take her husband's body for burial. It seemed that she was granted permission to come to the side of her dead husband while the whites, silent and armed, looked on. The woman, so went the story, knelt and prayed, then proceeded to unwrap the sheet, and before the white men realized what was happening, she had taken the gun from the sheet and had slain four of them, shooting at them from her knees. I did not know if the story was factually true or not, but it was emotionally true because I had already grown to feel that there existed men against whom I was powerless, men who could violate my life at will. I resolved that I would emulate the black woman if I were ever faced with the white mob. I would conceal a weapon, pretend that I was 
crushed by the wrong done to one of my loved ones, then, just when they thought I accepted their cruelty as the law of my life, I would let go with my gun and kill as many of them as possible before they killed me. The story of the woman's deception gave form and meaning to confused, defensive feelings that had been long sleeping in me. My imaginations, of course, had no objective value whatever. My spontaneous fantasies lived in my mind because I felt completely helpless in the face of this threat that might come upon me at any time, and because there did not exist to my knowledge any possible course of action which could have saved me if I had ever been confronted with a white mob. My fantasies were a moral bulwark that enabled me to feel I was keeping my emotional integrity whole a support that enabled my personality to limp through days lived under the threat of violence. These fantasies were no longer a reflection of my reaction to the white people. They were a part of my living, of my emotional life. They were a culture, a creed, a religion. The hostility of the whites had become so deeply implanted in my mind and feelings that it had lost direct connection with the daily environment in which I lived, and my reactions to this hostility fed upon itself, grew or diminished according to the news that reached me about the whites, according to what I aspired or hoped for. Tension would set in at the mere mention of whites and a vast complex of emotions involving the whole of my personality would be aroused. It was as though I was continuously reacting to the threat of some natural force whose hostile behavior could not be predicted. I had never in my life been abused by whites, but I had already become as conditioned to their existence as though I had been the victim of a thousand lynchings. I lived in West Helena an undeterminately long time before I returned to school and took up regular study. My mother luckily secured a job in a white doctor's office at the unheard of wages of five dollars per week, and at once she announced that her sons were going to school again. I was happy, but I was still shy and half paralyzed when in the presence of a crowd and my first day at the new school made me the laughing stock of the classroom. I was sent to the blackboard to write my name and address. I knew my name and address, knew how to write it, knew how to spell it, but standing at the blackboard with the eyes of the many girls and boys looking at my back made me freeze inside, and I was unable to write a single letter. Write your name. The teacher called to me. I lifted the white chalk to the blackboard, and, as I was about to write, my mind went blank. Empty. I could not remember my name, not even the first letter. Somebody giggled, and I stiffened. Just forget us and write your name and address, the teacher coaxed. An impulse to write would flash through me but my hand would refuse to move. The children began to twitter, and I flushed hotly. Don't you know your name? The teacher asked. I looked at her and could not answer. The teacher rose and walked to my side, smiling at me to give me confidence. She placed her hand tenderly upon my shoulder. What's your name? She asked. Richard, I whispered. Richard what? Richard Wright. Spell it. I spelled my name in a wild rush of letters, trying desperately to redeem my paralyzing shyness. Spell it slowly so I can hear it, she directed me. I did. Now, can you write? Yes, ma'am. Then write it. Again, I 
turned to the blackboard and lifted my hand to write. Then I was blank and void within. I tried frantically to collect my senses, but I could remember nothing. A sense of the girls and boys behind me filled me to the exclusion of everything. I realized how utterly I was failing, and I grew weak and leaned my hot forehead against the cold blackboard. The room burst into a loud and prolonged laugh, and my muscles froze. You may go to your seat, the teacher said. I sat and cursed myself. Why did I always appear so dumb when I was called upon to perform something in the crowd? I knew how to write as well as any pupil in the classroom, and no doubt I could read better than any of them. And I could talk fluently and expressively when I was sure of myself. And why did it strange faces make me freeze? I sat with my ears and neck burning, hearing the pupils whisper about me, hating myself, hating them. I sat still as stone in a storm of immersion surged through me. While sitting in class one day, I was startled to hear whistles blowing and the bells ringing. Soon the bedlam was deafening. The teacher lost control of her class and the girls and boys ran to the windows. The teacher left the room and when she returned she announced, Everybody, pack your things and go home. Why? What's happened? The war is over. The teacher said, I followed the rest of the children into the streets and saw that white and black people were laughing and singing and shouting. I felt afraid as I pushed through crowds of white people, but my fright left when I entered my neighborhood and saw smiling black faces. I wandered among them, trying to realize what war was, what it meant, and I could not. I noticed that many girls and boys were pointing at something in the sky. I looked up too and saw what seemed to be a tiny bird wheeling and sailing. Look! A plane! I had never seen a plane. It's a bird, I said. The crowd laughed. That's a plane, boy, a man said. It's a bird, I said. I see it. A man lifted me upon his shoulder. Boy, remember this, he said. You're seeing a man fly. I still did not believe it. It still looked like a bird to me. That night, at home, my mother convinced me that men could fly. Christmas came, and I had but one orange. I was hurt, and would not go out to play with the neighborhood children who were blowing horns and shooting firecrackers. I nursed my orange all of Christmas Day. At night, just before going to bed, I ate it, first taking a bite out of the top and sucking the juice from it as I squeezed it. Finally, I tore the peeling into bits and munched them slowly. End of chapter 2